So uh, what I'd like to share with everyone today is um, something about how we're going to uh, probe the building blocks of life using the ICH ERS JWST program. Um, and I'm presenting this, uh, I'm the PI for the program, I'm presenting this on behalf of the, the team. Um, so first I'd like to just go through a, a brief um, uh, motivation for why we're doing this. So as the, the title suggested, we're really interested in looking at the, the um, solid uh, carriers for different elements that make up um, life in the human body. Conveniently, the, the top uh, four contributors in terms of elements to, to the human body are also um, the some of the top six elements that dominate uh, cosmochemistry and chemistry in general, and they're most abundant in the universe, such as hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. However, we know um, that they are depleted on Earth. Um, they make up less than 1% of the total mass of the Earth, and they're really uh, regulated to the, the outermost skin of the Earth. Um, so um, <clears throat> this, this question of how a lot of the exoplanets that we see, how, how do we know whether they would have access to these uh, volatile elements in order to produce life and whether we could expect to see life in, in these um, other systems is something that we're really interested in. Um, so what we think happened for Earth is that a lot of this, this, uh, this sort of veneer or shell of, of volatile species were brought uh, through collisions with smaller bodies that also formed in the same protoplanetary disk from which Earth formed. Um, so this is, for example, um, like the uh, Comet 67P that we see here that was studied by Rosetta. And these, um, um, these bodies presumably uh, brought uh, simple ices, um, which is the, the, the easiest way to contain bulk volatile elements like water, um, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Um, but in addition to that, they also brought what we call complex organic molecules. And these are carbon rich, uh, large molecules that have more than six atoms. And they include things like methanol, which is considered to be the simplest complex organic mo molecule, um, as well as acetaldehyde, um, formic acid, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, and then they also included a, uh, um, uh, they also detected on Comet 67P a, uh, a proper biomolecule, glycine, which is actually the simplest amino acid. Um, so the implication is that certainly um, these collisions with external bodies brought both the bulk uh, elements that we need in order to form life, but they may have also brought them in a form that was sort of pre-mixed um, or pre-processed in a way that made it more conducive for life to form on Earth already by, by making them in a, in a sort of picnic basket that was um, easily available to just take them and start life. So Earth and comets um, are, are in the solar system. The solar system is an end product of the whole star formation process. Um, so that process starts in the dense molecular clouds in the, the upper left-hand corner where you have individual uh, dense cores that form in this molecular cloud. Um, one of those cores collapses, or each of those cores collapses to form a, uh, a central star with a disk around it, and, and the remainder of the core feeds onto that disk, or infalls onto that disk, and then eventually um, out of that disk you form a planetary system. So if, um, or based on uh, laboratory um, experiments, we, we've seen that you can form some of these complex molecules and certainly the simple ices at the temperatures that are appropriate for the uh, dense cold molecular cloud. And since each of these cloud, clouds hosts many cores, the implication there is that um, you, uh, if you form complex organic molecules already at that early stage um, and you collapse multiple star systems out of those, those uh, cores, then you potentially um, seed all of these forming systems with the ingredients of life already. So it, the life may not be unique to our solar system. So previous observations um, of ices, both simple ices and complex organics um, in the whole star formation process um, have touched upon each of these different stages. Um, however, most of the, the high quality observations that have been done have um, 
have been done for uh, protostellar envelopes. And this is just because they're bright, they're well known, um, and they're sort of individual single targets that, that are, uh, they're, they're easy to target individually, whereas uh, dense molecular cores would be mapped, need to be mapped with many observations of background stars, which are sort of hard, harder to do. And protoplanetary disks that can be used to identify ices tend to be seen edge on and therefore are relatively faint. So previous observations um, had, were insufficient in order to, um, to determine whether or not um, these, uh, the, these, these complex molecules could have made it all the way through the star formation process. Um, JWST will be a huge step forward in our understanding of this. Um, it will, it's the only facility um, upcoming that will be able to really get a handle on all of the ices, um, all the different species of ices in this, um, that are interesting for this question. So for example, this is a, a spectrum of a protostar that's a composite put together with some ground-based observations um, combined with uh, uh, Spitzer IRS observations from space. And you can see that there are ice species that, um, all the different ice species that correspond to carbon-rich ices, oxygen-rich ices, nitrogen-rich ices, and then also indicated in the sort of orangish color locations where we do see methanol and where we would expect to see complex organic molecules from laboratory data. Now, if we were to observe this from the ground, then all of the, the regions that are blacked out suddenly become unavailable to us, and we're only left with water um, and <clears throat> maybe a little bit of methanol and a little bit of ammonia and CO. Um, so JWST will give us a much wider wavelength range. It will get, get all of the ice features that we're interested in. Um, additionally, because JWST has multi-object capability, we'll be able to get hundreds of targets to do ice mapping in molecular clouds. Um, previously, the, the, um, the best ice mapping that has been done was with a sample of only 10 um, uh, protostars that have been targeted for this. And they were done very painstakingly and individually, and then an ice map was constructed after the fact. Um, so if we could get many more targets at the same time, that would be the ideal. Um, the third and fourth points that um, reasons that JWST will be much better is that um, it has about a factor of 25 more spectral resolution at the particular wavelengths that correspond to the complex organic molecules, and which will be really critical to distinguish between which molecules we see. So in the, the right-hand panel, this is a plot um, from Tervisha von Scheltinga et al. 2018, which combines laboratory data of two complex organic molecules, um, ethanol and acetaldehyde in, in blue and green respectively, and then shows how um, the features that you detect, uh, that we see from, from the lab of those molecules, how they line up with spectra from Spitzer. Um, versus spectra from, from ISO, and ISO had a much higher spectral resolution. You can see that in Spitzer, um, the, uh, the feature is basically only covered by a single wavelength element, um, whereas with ISO, you can actually see the, the whole feature profile. And ISO, this is with a resolution of 800, uh, JWST will have at this wavelength range a resolution of about 3,000. Um, so the problem with ISO is that it wasn't, um, uh, sensitive enough even though it had the resolution. Um, so we'll have something that's like a, a factor of, of at least 50 more sensitivity than um, even with Spitzer at the same wavelength range. Um, so this will allow us to answer questions like uh, how much simple ice exists all the way from the, the pre-stellar core stage through um, the protostellar envelope into the disk and whether or not the uh, processing that occurs to the dust grains during the star formation process, how that affects the complexity um, of the ices, and whether or not we have complex organic molecules in the ices by the time we form comets. So in order to answer these questions, we need not only the observations from JWST, but we also need a combination of laboratory data as well as chemical models. And this is because um, we, we wouldn't know what to look for, the molecules to look for, if we didn't have the laboratory data to indicate where different features were. And we also wouldn't know which of the um, uh, molecules to, that we observe in the lab are most likely to be seen in the astrophysical objects if we didn't have chemical models to take reaction rates from the lab and produce 
predicted abundances for for um, um, each of the different molecules in question. In question. Um, so the way that the Ice Age program uh, was conceived is that we had a um, Lorentz Center workshop back in. Oh, I'm blanking on this. This was 2016 already. <laughs> wow. Um, where we we got a bunch of people from all three of those fields together and sat down to discuss um, how we could best uh, go about getting some some initial ice data for the community to uh, play with and see what sorts of ices we expect to see so that could feed back into the laboratory um, astrophysics community so that it would inform their uh, studies of, of these ices on a time scale such that they could then iterate and get some more information out to us for future cycles of JWST given the short lifetime. Um, because five years is not much when you're trying to set up laboratory or laboratory experiments. Um, so uh, the, the the program has members uh, like 50 members from 11 different countries, mostly the U.S. and Europe, but with some representation um, from Japan and Taiwan as well. Um, I have uh, two other co-PIs, um, Professor Professor Harold Leonard at, at Leiden, as well as um, Dr. Adwin Bogart at University of Hawaii. And we also have a, a large number of co-eyes who are dedicated to the, the um, helping to produce the science products, as well as collaborators who are helping to support us on the, on the science goals. Um, so to describe more specifically what we're doing, this is the target region of interest. It's in Chameleon 1. It's sort of the central region of Chameleon 1. In red, you can see a dust filament um, from a, a, a submillimeter uh, mapping observation by Balashtal 2011, and you can see IRAC and MIPS in blue and green. I've indicated here with, with crosses and circles the targets that we know in advance that we're going to be specifically uh, targeting with individual observations. Um, we also, uh, here, to go to the, the sort of first set of observations that we're planning to do, we'll use uh, NIRCAM's wide field slitless spectrograph mode, as well as two of the um, the uh, broadband imaging modes to do sort of blind point and shoot mapping um, of the region um, going from the low density off core region onto the dust uh, the, the dust ridge itself. In blue, I indicate the known background stars. So what this will allow us to do is essentially get um, uh, a very high fidelity ice mapping for the um, this this dust ridge. We're planning to do a three-position mosaic observation um, using the wide field spectrograph mode. It will take about 13.4 hours. Um, this should increase by, by a factor of 100 the number of, of uh, background stars that have been mapped like this before. Um, from a technical perspective, we were hoping to, um, we're, we're, we're using this to develop um, algorithms to extract the wide field spectrograph uh, spectra um, from crowded fields that have a variable uh, background at different wavelengths. And this is based on some of our team members' experiences with the Akari mission. Um, so we're, we're developing algorithms there. And we'll also uh, test whether or not the, if we just take broadband imaging in the um, F410 versus F430 um, uh, medium um, band imaging filters um, that covers a continuum location and then the location on the CO2 ice feature, whether we can use those in, say, an extragalactic setting in order to more efficiently map that particular ice species in situations where the spectral quality or the, the signal to noise in the spectrum might not be good enough to do a proper spectrum. Um, so that takes up uh, a majority of, of the, the time in the program, or plurality of the time in the program. Um, the second objective is to see how deep we can go on two background stars where we already know, um, we, we already know their locations, we know that they should have extinctions of between 60 and 90 um, at, at visual wavelengths. And we're going to use a near spec uh, fixed slit mode as well as MIRI LRS mode to really see how deep we can go. These would be the deepest ever observations or the most, most extinction, extincted background star observations that have been performed to date. It will help us to see whether when you get to these really cold and dense um, 
regions, um, uh, whether or not you, you have a, an increase in the amount of complexity of the ice species, which is what we would predict from, from the laboratory observations. Technically speaking, it should uh, push NIRSPEC and MIRI LRS both to the, the limit for their sensitivity, um, and it will allow us to work on some um, testing how to defringe the LRS data in conjunction with the GTO team here at Leiden. The third, um, tech, uh, the third part of the program is to um, target using NIRSPEC's IFU mode and MIRI MRS mode, um, one uh, edge on protostar and one uh, edge on disk, which are located in close proximity to the central core region. Um, this will allow us to, to test NIRSPEC on extended targets and compare MIRI LRS and MRS for the same target, namely the protostar, um, again, with the goal to see how well the differentiating algorithm works for both LRS and MRS. Um, we'll spend a total of about eight hours each on, on, on each of those targets. Um, and the total time for the program is about 31 and a half hours. So um, this is just one part of the program, the observational part. Like I said, we, we need to have a synergy, or we, 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 we have a synergy between um, the observations, chemical modeling, and laboratory data in order to actually get the best science out of this. So on the observational side, once we have all of these data and we've done our, um, uh, done our comparisons between the different modes to see uh, what the best, best practices are for observing ICES with GWST, um, we'll provide a, a technical document with all of the best practices in it. We'll also provide enhanced extracted data that we've applied are, are the algorithms that we're working on too. Um, and then we'll get extinction curves, um, empirically derived extinction curves out of the background star data so that people in future cycles can have a, a, um, a more updated um, molecular cloud extinction curve in addition to, to what's going into the uh, space telescope uh, ETC. Then our fourth uh, science enabling product will be that we, in order to analyze the ice data in the first place, we need to have a chemical modeling grid that predicts the abundances given the physical conditions for the chameleon one cloud. Um, so we'll have that grid prepared in order to fit the data that we have. But in addition, the same code can be applied to other different environments. So for example, something that has um, higher uh, UV radiation for like a high mass star farming region or an extragalactic um, uh, uh, physical environment. So we'll have additional model grids by cycle two for, for that so that people can see uh, what sort of ices they would expect to see and what abundances in these environments. And the final uh, uh, science enabling product is that we've um, got about uh, four or five different ice, uh, ice laboratory groups within the ERS collaboration. So right now we're working with them to um, get their um, optical constants absorption spectra um, for different simple and complex ices with a range of temperatures and mixing ratios and also ice formation rates under, under different cloud conditions and put that in a uniform database that will be accessible to everyone for planning observations. Um, and if you want to stay connected with us, we obviously have the, the um, website at uh, Space Telescope. You can download our APT file, um, uh, program number 1309. Um, we currently have a public homepage. I list the, the address here. It's actually not what's listed in the, the Space Telescope page. Um, eventually, we hope to have on that page uh, PDFs from various outreach talks that we've given um, and a comments and questions section in case people want to contact us. Um, that's still under construction, mostly because I'm the one working on it. <laughs> uh, so if you want uh, faster responses, if you can contact either of the three PIs directly, and I put our email addresses there at the bottom. So thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you for that informative talk. Um, this is open for questions. Anyone online, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yeah, this is Sasha in Exeter. I just had a quick question from Melissa, and apologies if you covered this. And this might be kind of a naive question, but 
presumably in some of these protostellar cores and uh, that these stars are, are presumably started to uh, burn hydrogen. And so I'm just, I'm wondering how you disentangle the spectral signatures from these protoplanetary disks or even these cores from any sort of early starlight that's being generated from these. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm a little, I'm a little confused. They, they would only start burning hydrogen when they get to a more evolved state past the pre-main sequence stage. So we, we do have a few early type stars. Like if, if I, let me go back to this image. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the more massive ones that aren't really doing core hydrogen burning because that happens later, but still there must be an, a huge amount of luminosity just from these cores. And I'm, I'm wondering if yeah. you see a spectroscopic feature, how you know that's from actually like a protoplanetary disk or how it's how, how much is from just the sort of uh, so, so core it, star itself. In, in, in this um, so in, in, in this particular image, there is um, one of the stars that uh, there, there's the, 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 the blue dots indicate the stars that have um, mostly cleared the material around them. Um, they still have disks, though. I mean, it, it's I guess the, the signatures of a disk are completely different from the signatures of the central protostar. So I, I'm not. I'm yeah, not, I think that's the answer to my question right there. Yeah. And, and, and the, the ice features are also very, very broad. And and they, they they don't look anything like say absorption lines that you might get or emission lines that you might get from from closer to the central protostar for hotter stars. So they they have a very distinct signature. All right. Um, any other questions? I had one question. I was wondering if you could comment on the utility of like near spec MSA, like if you did a pre imaging of near cam and then could follow up. I know you couldn't do that for this program because of the constraints, but can, it, do you think that's viable? Yeah, so I, I think if, if we had that as an option, we, we would have, but in, um, I, I think it will be useful to have the near cam wide field slitless spectrograph mode as a as a, as a sort of test because the pre imaging does require a, a larger time scale and a little bit more work, um, and it's not totally clear whether w once you've dealt with all of the light leakage issues whether um, it, yeah what, I, I think the signal to noise would still be better with the MSA mode. Uh, this, sorry, the signal noise in the continuum would still be better with the MSA mode than with wide field slitless spectrograph. Um, so we would probably prefer that in the future. But at least the ERS program will provide a good way to test this because I don't think anyone would have immediately gone out and tried to use this mode without being forced to. <laughs> 